So nice to be back. And it's this is, uh, I w I'm just going to say it's a better year than last year because last year Craig and Nancy weren't with us. And uh, what a blessing to see how God brought you through that harrowing experience. Good to have you back, Craig. Thank you. Good to be back. How do you respond to failure? A lot of people respond to failure differently. Some people are discouraged and devastated by what many of us would think of as small failures. For some, it's, it's worse than that. I read an article recently by a lady named Lindsay Inzer. The title of the article is, What I Want People to Know About My Attempted Suicide. And she said that she came to a point where she felt like a failure as a mother, a wife, a daughter, and a friend. So she got in her car, she called a friend and said, I'm done. Went for a drive and woke up in the emergency room. She lived. Back in the early 1900s, a phrase was born. I wonder how many of you have ever used this phrase, win some, lose some. You ever said that? I haven't been able to find out who the first person was who said that, but they say it comes from sports gamblers in the early 1900s. I don't know, maybe they'll give you pause the next time you think of saying that, win some, lose some. Some people seem to be able to just go right along after a failure and it doesn't seem to daunt them at all. And then there's Charlie Chaplin, the famous English comic actor of the era of silent movies. Here's what he thought about failure. He said, failure is unimportant. It takes courage to make a fool of yourself. <laughs> but how should Christians view failure? Pastor John Maxwell says that the difference between people, average people and people who are achievers comes down to their perception and response to failure. I think failure and how we respond to failure is an important issue. I want to turn to a story in the Bible about failure. And I think it'll be review for most of us. We'll look at it again. If you have your Bible, Joshua chapter 7. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 7. And I'm going to start at verse 2. And it says, Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth-Avon on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Terrible defeat, which, by the way, was right on the heels of a wonderful victory, right? Jericho. And now notice Joshua's response to this failure. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? 
a failure, a terrible failure for God's people. And actually, we're told in verse 1, I didn't start at verse 1, but if we go back and look at chapter 7, verse 1, it says, The children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. So my question is, what happens when people defy the instructions of God today. And they were very clear instructions. If you can read the previous chapter, God made it explicitly clear, don't take anything, no one take anything from this city. The silver and the gold were to be taken to the temple. Nothing was to be taken personally. That was made absolutely clear. What happens today when people defy the instructions of God. I mean, if, if you're like me, this thought must have crossed your mind a time or two. Is this a different God than the God of the Old Testament? All sorts of things happen in the name of God, in the church of God. Dark crimes and sins. Pedophilia infidelity, embezzlement, and I suppose the list could go on, and yet when's the last time you saw 36 men killed because of it? And we don't see anyone stoned because of it. People look on, and, and I, find, I found myself asking the question, why do they get away with it? What's different? As I thought about this, it occurred to me that it's important to make a distinction that what happened at AI was not punishment. Because it's tempting to take a story like this and sort of develop this, uh, sorry, this is what's coming to mind, but kind of a candy machine God idea that you put in a quarter and you get something out, right? And if you're good, everything goes good for you. And if you're bad, bad things happen to you. But we have the book of Job, right? A righteous, devout man that things went terribly for him. So that's not, that can't be what this is about. I want to suggest to you that this story illustrates something that is just as true today as it was in, in these days, the time of AI. That when you choose to go without God, you're on your own. And there are some battles that are won in human strength. Some battles can be won in human strength, and some battles can be lost. And if you're going to go without God, then I suppose you might as well adopt that saying, win some, lose some, right? And they went out and they lost one. Now, fair to say, you know, they didn't have a lot of experience. But I like to think that perhaps it was the mercy of God that they lost that one right away before things maybe deteriorated and got even worse. But if you're on your own, win some, lose some. Ultimately, you lose. If you go with God, you win. And ultimately, you win. I want to take a few moments to think about Achan because I'm not going to take a lot of time to go through the story. But I want to sort of dwell on it for a few minutes because it's a very interesting process that God took his people through in revealing Achan, don't you think? And I got to, I've thought about this before, but I decided to make a list this time as I was looking at this story. And I found seven opportunities for Achan to repent. There were seven opportunities. And by the way, this process, which you know, well, maybe I should, 
I'll, I'll give you the list I came up with, and maybe you'll see something more. And you, please share it with me if you do. But first of all, there were the instructions in Joshua chapter 6, verse 18. You can read them very explicit. No one should take anything from the city personally. And if you keep in mind that this comes on the heel of remarkable, miraculous works on the part of God to deliver his people, and all of that is, is, is still fresh in their minds when this happens. And mind you, uh, I, I'm not making too big of a deal out of that because Achan was the only one who did this. I mean, out of all of, of the people, there was one person who ventured to do this. So it must have been impressive. The instructions were clear. And then there was the defeat at Jericho. That's number two to me. That's the number two opportunity or warning. This was a miraculous defeat by any stretch. I, it was so interesting to me a, a few years ago, I read an article about uh, sort of a debate among archaeologists who some believe they had found the city of Jericho and others uh, felt like it was not. And the reason that these other archaeologists felt it was not really Jericho was because they knew for a city of that time there would be walls around it and there, were, there was no evidence of any walls around that city. And so these opposing archaeologists said couldn't be Jericho. Isn't that ironic? So when God causes the walls to fall, they really fall. So this was a powerful, miraculous display of God's power, and that is opportunity number two. The thought must have crossed Achan's mind, whoa! But he did it anyway, and he went forward. And so then we get to opportunity number three is the announcement. After that prayer that Joshua prayed that we just read, God said, here's the problem. Here's what you need to do about it call a solemn convocation with the whole group of people and tell them ahead of time. Give them a day. Tell them we're going to do this the next day. And we're going to go through a process of pinpointing the person. So that's opportunity number three. So that 24-hour period passes. The next day comes. All the people are called together. And then God starts to hone in on the person. First, the tribe. That's opportunity number five. Then uh, the announcement was opportunity number four. Okay, the tribe is identified. And you have to imagine, I mean, I do, there must have been a huge whew, in those other tribes. <laughs> imagine this prolonged process as God is honing in and it gets closer and closer, and people in their hearts are searching, praying to God. Because they don't know what all this constitutes yet, what all it's about. And then the family, that's opportunity number six. It comes to the family. There's more sighs of relief, but more concern. And then the household. That's opportunity number seven. So those are seven opportunities. Now after that, it's pinpointed down to the man as, as I, I understand the story and as I try to process this in my mind. At that point, it's too late. But think about this. Aiken hung on all that time. That's the definition of a cherished sin. Just holding on to it. You know... When you think about this, and we think about the end of Achan, there's a quote that came to mind, and I jotted it down, from Christ Object Lessons 84. God destroys no man. Everyone who is destroyed will have destroyed himself. What if Achan had repented? at any of those points along the way? What do you think? Would he have found mercy? Now, you can read it in Patriarchs and Prophets, and I think the evidence is there. It's not explicitly stated, but I'm just going to turn to chapter 7, verse 15, where notice the language. 
in Joshua chapter 7, verse 15. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire. The accursed thing was what had to go. And he that shall be taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire. It really is a solemn warning about the dangers of secret sin. Now, an argument could be made that there are very few sins that are secret. Keeping a secret is probably the, one of the hardest things to do, right? I heard, some, I heard an old man say one time that every woman knows one woman who won't tell anyone. I don't want to pick on the ladies, but I do believe there are some conspiracies. The Bible certainly talks about one, but I'm not a conspiracy theorist in general. I'll probably stir up some comments on this. But anyway, you know, I used to get lots of stuff in the mail from people. And one day I got a VHS video and it just had one word on it. Moon? Question mark. So when we would get these things, you know, if I was doing something, sort of some mindless task in the family room, I'd pop it in and I'd watch it. And it was, it was a video that really was pretty interesting of this notion that we never went to the moon. I'm not going to spend much time on this, okay? And if this is a pet topic of yours, talk to me afterwards. I'm interested in what you think. But, I, but this is what I concluded. That the hardest thing about that whole theory is keeping it a secret keeping it a secret all the way through. So you could say that, you know, is there really any secret sin? You know the old saying, be sure your sins will find you out. And secret sins aren't secret forever, but there certainly are some sins that can be kept quite secret. And they're dangerous. They shape us. They, they affect the way we perceive the world around us. They color our thoughts. They affect our decisions. They can get to the point where it interferes with our decision making to the point that devastating decisions can be made. They're distracting. Now, there's another interesting thing about this particular sin because, you know, as Mrs. White kind of pinpoints this for us and she identifies it as covetousness that Aiken saw this and he wanted it and to some degree or another uh, we, we all have experienced covetousness at some time but as I was thinking about covetousness it occurred to me that one of the interesting things about covetousness is that and, and I suppose many secret sins is that the sins themselves cloud our perception of the sins and serve to make it even more difficult and we find ways to rationalize it. But I want to talk for a moment about things that cloud our perception. And I already mentioned covetousness and closely related worldliness. But I heard something recently that made me think. Someone was talking about Roger Murnau's book, Trip into the Supernatural. You, you've, are all of you familiar with Roger Minot, who has an amazing story? You know, he was, got very involved in the occult, and then he came out of that. He became a Seventh-day Adventist, and he wrote at least, I think, two books. And there are lots of interviews. You can watch his interviews on YouTube. But he's, he, he refers, if, I, if my memory serves me correct, he talks about a meeting. And as I remember, it was a meeting of... <coughs> the devil's minions, demons, and the master, Satan. <clears throat> and someone asked about the Seventh-day Adventists. And it's reported that the master said, well, yeah, we, we don't spend too much energy on those people because they believe the Sabbath. And so they're protected from deception. Now, I don't know, I haven't, heard what Roger Renault thought about that. He's just reporting what happened in that meeting. But I know that some people believe that. 
and I think we should pause and say, wait a minute, that was spoken by a demon or by the devil himself. And I thought about that and I thought, that's got to be one of the greatest deceptions of modern time for Seventh-day Adventists to think that if you believe the Sabbath, that you've got some sort of protection against deception and that the devil can't get at you. And as I was pondering this, I was thinking about this whole idea and a, and a, a statement came to my mind. You, you've probably read this before, Desire of Ages, page 309 and 310. In all human experience, a theoretical knowledge of the truth has been proven to be insufficient for the saving of the soul. And I started to think about the danger of resting in the satisfaction that we understand theological truth. And I think there's a danger in an overemphasis of doctrinal and theological truth at the expense of a hard experience. And please don't misunderstand me. I think theological truth is very important. But the devil can use a focus on theological truth and doctrine to shroud the reality of our own lack of spirituality in our heart and in our life. Because our whole consuming theme becomes the truth and standing for what's truth and, and being a champion of correct doctrine and correct truth. If you read on the rest of the statement, Desire of Ages 309 and 10, she talks about how people can lack in even common courtesy and yet stand as champions of the truth. And she says something interesting about it. It can come to a point where the truth in those lives becomes a curse to themselves because it's shrouding their own lack, but to the whole world it can become a curse. How ironic. Well, what do we do about Aikens today? There's some people that be very interested to find the Aiken in their church and kick him out, right? Are there Aikens today? Patriarchs and Prophets 497 says this, The influence most to be feared by the church is not that of open opposers, infidels, and blasphemers, but of inconsistent professors of Christ. These are the ones that keep back the blessing of the God of Israel and bring weakness upon his people. But still, the question is, what do we do? How do we find them? How can the Achans be sought out and rooted out of the church? She goes on, and here's what Mrs. White says, which I think is very interesting. When the church is in difficulty... When coldness and spiritual declension exist, giving occasion for the enemies of God to triumph, then instead of folding their hands and lamenting their unhappy state, let its members inquire if there is not an Aiken in the camp. Right, here we go. With humiliation and searching of heart, let each seek to discover the hidden sins that shut out God's presence. As I read that, I felt convicted. Is there spiritual coldness, declension in the church today? And I realized my task is to search my heart, is to ask, are there hidden sins in my heart, in my life? The search for Achan needs to happen, and it's the search that asks, Am I Aiken? Am I the one? All right, well, back to Ai, Joshua chapter 8. After Aiken was dealt with, and I know I'm brushing over a story that is uh, an incredible, compelling, even disturbing story, but we're going to move forward now because I want to push toward a point here. Joshua chapter 8, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you, 
and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its cattle you shall take, interesting, isn't that, as booty for yourselves. Lay an ambush for the city behind it. Something's different this time. We're going back to Ai, but something is different. This time, we're going with instructions from God. And if you go back and read, it's very interesting. That is absent the first time around. As I was pondering this, I was asking myself, where do I get my cues? Where do we get our cues? There are influences in my life on a daily basis that shape my thinking, that shapes my, my perspectives about life and the world and my relationships. Those influences are giving me cues. I'm going to make a little confession here. The, the last election cycle here in America revealed something to me. And it's come only more and more in sharp focus since then. And that was that I was really getting into politics. It revealed something else to me, that a lot of Seventh-day Adventists are really into politics. That's just my assessment, okay? We're very political people. And I feel like that there's been a growing conviction in my heart and in my life that there's a danger that politics and political bias colors my perceptions and gives me my cues. There's something else that we're all more and more bombarded with these days, and that's the media. Nobody even talks about TV anymore, right? You don't need TV. We got these little guys here, and I got my YouTube app, and YouTube's a great place to go when I'm searching for something, right? There's stuff I want to know how to do, and it's not in Country Living University, so I go to YouTube. And have you noticed? There, YouTube has a primary goal. Do you know what it is? You know what YouTube's number one goal is? Did you think it was to, to help you get the information you want? Their number one goal is to keep you on YouTube because then you're going to see ads. So their task is to keep you on YouTube. So then there's all these other things that come up and we are bombarded with media. Where do you get your cues? Where do I get my cues? Is it media? Is it music? I just want to touch on this, you know, because I've had a couple conversations now with the younger generation over the last, I don't know, six or eight months. And there have been, and I would like, I would encourage all of us who have kids to please keep an open relationship with your kids on this music question and ask the Lord to give you wisdom so you can keep that channel open, so you can continue to have discussions about the music. And I know it's tricky because, you know, they got the little earbuds, right? So you don't always know what they're listening to. But still, I like to be able to have conversations about the music. And I've heard from two different young people now in the last six months or so when I was talking about a song, and I, I said, well, have you listened to the words of that song? And the response was, I'm not paying attention to the words. I like the tune. I like the tune. And, you know, the, the master of music who was kicked out of heaven knows how to create some captivating tunes to sort of reel you in and hold you there so that you'll just keep hearing the words. And it's influencing you. I want to appeal, and, and, and maybe you're not a young person, but if, it's an, if the shoe fits, wear it. But I know that our young people are being hit with this, and I want to appeal to you. Don't allow the enemy to program your mind. 
it's not worth it for that captivating tune. Because in both of these cases, both of these young people said to me, yeah, well, those aren't very good words, but I like the tune. It's not worth it to be held locked in the enemy's grasp while he programs your mind. Media is a broad topic, and that's not the point here, but we could talk about a lot of things. Movies. People say, well, I don't watch movies. Talk shows. That's what gets some of us, right? It's the talk shows we like. Where are you getting your cues? I don't watch any of that stuff. I just watch the news. Not getting any cues from the news, right? I got to keep up with what's going on, so... CNN, NBC, MSNBC. But I find, you know, that in our crowds, what about Fox News? You won't get any, any miscues from them, right? It's only going to be right. I'm asking myself, and I invite you to ask the Lord along with me, am I getting bad cues? things that influence my thinking, things that color my perceptions. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. This week, I started to think more than I have before. I need to be praying, how would Jesus perceive of these issues? How would, you know, we ask, what would Jesus do? How about what would Jesus think? How, what would Jesus say? How would Jesus perceive the issues that we're confronted with in our world? Because they are very real issues. And when I, when I mention politics, and you know, one thing that's come home to me is we've had a lot of counsel not to get real enthusiastic about politics. And if there's any time when it should be clear, it would be now. But that does not mean that we should be somehow aloof from the world and non-participative and unwilling to be involved in trying to turn the tide. It has to do with where our head is. What are we immersing our thoughts in? Who are we allowing to guide our thinking? Are we just reflectors of a party of thought? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. This is really, and this story about AI, for me, is a call to prayer. It's a call to ask the Lord <clears throat> to guide me, to give me insights as to how would Jesus perceive everything? How does he perceive everything around me? But one of the big lessons here in this story is also that prayer is not enough. Prayer is not enough. I want to read to you, you can read with me if you've got your Bible, Joshua chapter 7, verse 10, which is the Lord's response to that heartfelt prayer. And have you ever prayed a prayer like Joshua did in the face of some defeat in your own life? Like, where, Lord, where are you? What do we say? The world looks on. And this is how the Lord responded. So the Lord said to Joshua, Joshua 7, verse 10, get up. Get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have stolen and deceived, and they have put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies. Get up. Why do you lie on your face? Prayer is not enough. God calls us to take action. Our call today is one of faith and works. Faith and works. No apology made. There is a part we have to play. In fact, I read that it is required that all be brought to the task. Everything we have to bring to the challenge. This quote 
Testimonies, Volume 4, page 538 and 539 says it better. Prayer and effort, effort and prayer, will be the business of your life. You must pray as though the efficiency and praise were all due to God and labor as though duty were all your own. Well, if we read the story, you'll see chapter 8 describes a great victory. They did go up, and they experienced a great victory at Ai. And what I like about this in this story is that God is the God of second chances. It didn't just end with that failure. God gave them an opportunity to go back again. And in reality, it's more than the God of second chances, right? Somebody here can say that you had more than two, right? And so they went back. And I believe that we are in need of a great victory today. We need it in the church. We need it in our families. We need it as individuals. It's time for victory. It's time to go back to AI and conquer. And that means that we have to be willing for searching of heart. And so I want to ask you today, how is your heart? Have you just returned from AI? Are you feeling defeated? Do you find yourself distracted? I want to ask you just to ponder for a few moments and, and ask the Holy Spirit to kind of shine the light there. Do you recognize a lack of spirituality in your life? Do you long for spiritual perspective? A peace that passes understanding, an assurance of victory that you can go forward knowing that God is going to be with you. You can have that today because today is another chance. AI was your nemesis, but it's about to become your victory. In fact, I want to read verse 1 of chapter 8 again. Because if you feel like anything I just said describes you, listen to this. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid nor dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. In Acts of the Apostles, there's a great quote, and I want to close with this. There is no possibility of failure before the one who, advancing by faith, ascends round by round, ever upward and onward, to the topmost round of the ladder that reaches even to the portals of heaven. That's a promise for you. It's a promise for me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercies to each one of us. We've all experienced failure. We recognize also that you were the God of victory. And so we want to turn to you just now and ask for that searching in our heart that we need. Show us those things in life, in our lives, Lord, that are resulting in us going it alone. And I pray that as a result of this request to you, that we will, in your strength and in your power, do as the scripture says, get up. 
and go forward. That we'll allow you to cleanse our hearts and our lives of the things that separate us from you. And that we'll go forth in your power and your might and conquer. I pray for great victories for individuals, for families here today, for your church. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.